Hi, uh, let me start over again. Hello again, good afternoon. My name is Benjamin Fleischman. I have the great pleasure of welcoming you to the Adam Street Synagogue, or Adam Street Shul, as a lot of us call it, uh, better known as Congregation uh, Guna Safin Ashid de Safar. As I was saying, it means the Brotherhood of Men who dab in Safar. That's just a particular way Jewish people can dab it. Uh, I had some questions coming in. Yes, we are Orthodox Shul, uh, but we're very open to everyone. And uh, we have a very diverse, as you learned from Barry, a very diverse neighborhood. There are very many diverse Jews. And this is one of the oldest synagogues uh, here in Massachusetts. It is 100 years old now. We're celebrating our centennial, just like Fenway Park. Uh, we've had many, many events organized and have had a lot of people come and visit us this year. And you will learn that just like this neighborhood is diverse, so are the Jewish people diverse, and at one time this was the only synagogue here in Newton, and therefore it was open to all Jews and all kinds of persuasions, and we're sort of still that way. Now at this time I'd like to turn it over to Barry, and she'd like to tell you a lot of the history of the shul, how it was built, the ark, her family's involvement, and more important how it's still a very, very active shul today. Um, a good Achim, our synagogue has a big long name, a good Achim on Shay People don't call it by that name. Um, it's kind of a tradition that uh, old Jewish synagogues were called by the name of the street where they were located. So we are very often called the Adam Street Synagogue. In Yiddish, the Adam Street Shul, S-H-U-L. Um, it comes from the German Shula, meaning school. Uh, synagogue is both a school and a place of, of worship and prayer. Um, Agudosachim means something like a brotherhood. Um, we are the oldest synagogue. We are the first synagogue in Newton. We are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. There are now 15 synagogues in Newton, but they all started much, much later than this one here. Um, the synagogue is not the oldest house of worship in, in the city. Uh, there's an Episcopal church that was started in 1813. Uh, there's Myrtle Baptist Church, which is about 135 years old, a black church. Um, I mentioned Our Ladies, which was founded in, uh, in, uh, in 1873. I mention this because it really points out something that I was trying to convey to you earlier, which is the diversity of the city, and especially of this neighborhood, uh, that it has been home to and continues to be home to people of many, many different backgrounds. And I think Newton itself as a city is unique in that it is still a welcoming place for people of many, many different backgrounds. Um, we are the oldest synagogue in Newton, the first synagogue in Newton. Um, there are probably only one or two other synagogues in, Mass in eastern Massachusetts, the greater Boston area, from this period of time. Um, many of the synagogues from the 1920s um, were founded in Roxbury and Dorchester, which at that time in the 1920s was the center of, of Jewish life in Boston. None of those, although they're contemporary with our synagogue, none of those are still synagogues. They are now all churches. Um, one of the other things that I want to mention is that I mentioned and I spoke before about the sense of community that exists in this neighborhood. <coughs> the synagogue is empty almost all the week. We don't have any permanent employees, we don't have any um, full-time employees, and yet the people in the neighborhood understand and respect our synagogue and really protect it. We really feel that it is their honoring our synagogue that keeps our synagogue safe. Um, this congregation was founded by members of the local Jewish community who lived here um, around the turn of the 20th century. And for the first years of its existence, the congregation met in private homes. It did not have a building. Um, among the, one of the buildings that they rented on the Jewish high holidays when they needed a lot of space was Lafayette Hall, the French building. Um, in fact, when Lafayette Hall became a church, it was no longer suitable for us to rent, and then they decided, well, you're going to start building. And so we came into existence. 
The building of a synagogue was a major undertaking <coughs> for the Jews of this community, as they were all immigrants and they were all very poor. I mentioned six junkyards on West Street. Uh, my grandfather was one of them. The, you didn't need to speak much English to be a junk peddler. Uh, you had to be able to count, and you had to know words describing what kind of junk you bought. I didn't know this until recently, that junk peddlers specialized, even in those days. Um, there was a, a guy who did only paper, who was a member of the congregation. My grandfather specialized in metal, copper, and lead, and brass, and tin. Um, there were others who specialized in rags. So you had to know those few words in English, but you really didn't need to speak English. Um, and you could have a business and support a family. Um, and m most important to some of these people is you did not have to work on the Sabbath. Uh, many of you know that until probably 1920s or 1930s, um, everybody worked half a day on Saturday. That's not an option for an observant Jew to work on Saturday. So you couldn't work on Saturday. You had to have your own business or you worked for a Jewish business. There were some Jewish businesses here in town, but they couldn't absorb all of the population. So many of the immigrants became businessmen, not necessarily because they wanted to be businessmen, but it was the only way that they could earn a living. We had the, well, the fundraising book for the synagogue, which recorded every donation that was made to the building of the synagogue. Most of the donations were for 10 cents, 25 cents. You could buy a dozen eggs for a nickel. So a donation of 25 cents was a, a pretty fair donation. I would like to mention that there were three major donations to the synagogue of $100 each. $100 might be months, months of wages for a family in this neighborhood. Interestingly, two of those donations came from non-Jews. One of them, and this is an, again an example of how I think Newton is very different from other places. One of those $100 donations came from the man who was the mayor of Newton. His name was Mayor Hatfield. It is really, to me, as a Jew, the idea that in 1912, when there were maybe 50 or 60 Jews, maybe 75 Jews, maybe 100, they certainly were not going to change an election. Many of them didn't vote. They were not citizens. Yet that mayor considered it important to welcome the community in a very real way by making a major donation. The other donation came from a local non-Jewish doctor who got a lot of business in the neighborhood, so it was good business for him. Uh, the third donation was from a very famous Jewish financier named Jacob Schiff. Schiff was a big shot in New York, um, one of the sort of robber, Jewish robber barons. Um, the Jewish community, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much, doctor. When they got the donation from Jacob Schiff, they wrote it in the book in letters this big. They thought that was just the most moving and wonderful thing that, that could have happened to them. Um, in every other synagogue that you have heard about, you have heard that there was a rabbi. Until the synagogue was 95 years old, we did not have a rabbi. The synagogue was run entirely by members of the congregation, and they would hire someone to come in to lead the prayers on special holidays. And other than that, they did everything themselves. The synagogue couldn't afford a rabbi. The building was a big deal for a little group like this. Um, just to buy the land, oh, I should mention, I mentioned Jacob Schwartz, the founder of Schwartz Hardware. Here's a mystery for you. If any of you can figure out the answer, I'd be really happy to hear it. We have a paper that shows that Mr. Swartz bought the land, this piece of land in which the synagogue was built, and donated it to the synagogue for one dollar. The mystery is, did he collect the money from members of the congregation and he was just a straw to buy the land for the synagogue? Or did he in fact donate the money for the land himself? And we don't know, 
and there is nobody left alive who does know. If any of you have ever heard anything, tell me, I want to know. Um, the synagogue never had an architect. Um, they probably never heard the word architect in this congregation. Um, they probably said to whoever was doing the building, this is what we want. And this synagogue looks like uh, we've had people come here from Russia. We've had people come here from England. We've had people from South Africa. Um, we've had people from Western Europe. And they all say the same thing. This looks just like the place my grandfather used to pray in. And they're right, because it was a kind of a standard um, design, um, which, which was copied, and, and that's what we have here today. Um, the, uh, the building has 12 windows, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, the building faces east towards Jerusalem. According to Jewish tradition, you should have at least one window which looks toward the east. In order to keep the symmetry of the building, there are two windows which, which look east. Um, the building originally had gas light and probably having all these beautiful windows made it possible to see better. Um, when there wasn't a great deal of light uh, in the synagogue. When they built the building, they had run out of money. They finished the outside, they finished the inside, and then they had no more money. They couldn't buy benches or chairs to sit on. So everybody was told to bring a chair from home, literally, bring your own chair. Um, after a while, they acquired a bunch of children's desks. Those of you who are elderly will remember um, the desks that were made. They had a metal frame, they were bolted to the floor, they had a wooden frame, the top flipped open, and you could keep things inside. There was an ink well. You remember those desks? Well, that was what they sat on for a long time. You can imagine grown men squeezing into those little kitty desks, but that was what they had for a number of years. Sometime, probably in the 1940s, we're not sure exactly when, the benches that you're sitting on came here from another synagogue. We're not sure exactly which synagogue. Um, we don't know exactly when. These are contemporary with the age of the building, but they were not original. You had, first you had your own chair, um, and then you had those little desks, and then finally we were upgraded. Uh, to this. Um, I mentioned my grandfather was the founder of this synagogue. And those of you who um, are Protestants, some of the old Protestant churches have pews. And you know that pews could be bought and that they could be um, passed down from one generation to the other. You could keep the same pew. Well, the synagogue doesn't have pews in that sense, but that chair right there, that is considered the best seat in the house, and it was reserved for the most honored member of the community, aside from the rabbi who sat here, and the president of the congregation sat there, and this was my grandfather's seat. Um, and in fact, I have a deed. You could deed your seat, um, in which his seat, uh, his wife's seat, which was up in the balcony, you could pass <coughs> those seats down. Uh, from one generation to the next. Uh, let me see. Okay. I said that the congregation, when they finished building the building, didn't have any money. They put together, in a Jewish synagogue, the most valuable possession that we have are the Torah scrolls, the, what the Christians call the Old Testament. The five books of Moses are on scrolls and they're kept in a special cabinet. And it has been the tradition that this cabinet in which these scrolls are kept becomes the focal point of the synagogue building. When they finished building this building in 1912, they didn't have any money to have some fancy decorated place to keep the arcs. So they took the wainscoting, the bead board that is on the sides here, and they knocked together a box, and they got a bed sheet for a curtain, the ark always has a curtain, and they put the bed sheet up, and from 1912 to 1924, that was the ark. 
So you can imagine this was a real bare bones place. These were very people of very modest means. And they were not particularly concerned that the synagogue should be fancy. It was big enough for what they needed. It was something that they were proud that they had been able to establish and maintain, but they were pretty lackadaisical about things. In the early 1920s, the children of the original immigrants were getting married. And these children had primarily been educated here in Newton in the public schools. And their attitude toward things was a little bit more, shall we say, sophisticated. They were embarrassed by the box with the bed sheet. And they embarrassed the older generation <coughs> into hiring a, a builder to build this ark. I'll tell you a little bit about the man who built it. His name is Samuel Katz. And Mr. Katz was an immigrant from the Ukraine, a cabinet maker, um, and a woodworker. And he probably built more ark, synagogue arcs than any other person that we know about in the United States. Most of those arcs now are in synagogues in Roxbury and Dorchester, in synagogues which have become churches. This is one of the last arcs that is still being used in a synagogue as an ark. Mr. Katz had a little book, a little old school notebook, and he had drawn little pictures. And you could pick what style columns do you want? How elaborate do you want this to be? How much gold paint do you want on the ark? And it was like the Sears catalog. You could pick and choose what you wanted based upon how much money you had, based upon how much space you had, and based upon your taste. So this is the ark that they decided to build in 1924. It is mahogany. It's all made by hand, all carved by hand, and all that gilt paint. Um, the, uh, the people, we still have the original ark, by the way, downstairs. Um, and it's quite a contrast to this beautiful piece of artwork. I'll just very, very quickly go over some of the, um, the symbolism and, and, uh, of the build of it. Okay, first is the Jewish star at the top, you're familiar with that. Uh, the Ten Commandments with a crown. There's a saying in Judaism that the Torah, the five books of Moses, is the crown of the Jewish people. And so it's very common to have a crown as a symbol. Uh, the two lions are the lions of Judah. You've all heard about those. Uh, and the book is a special and unique feature. Uh, Mr. Katz, although he himself was not religious, came from a very religious background. And it is a custom in Orthodox congregations for people whose name is Cohen, who are descendants of the high priests in the temple in Jerusalem. It is their custom to bless the congregation. And this is now done very often by the rabbi in many congregations, but in an Orthodox congregation there's a very specific ceremony, ritual, which is done. And the high pri the priests hold their hands like this, it's hard to do. Okay? Uh, those of you who have kids, you remember a program called Star Trek. Um, Leonard Nimoy is, as you know, a native Bostonian. He grew up in a synagogue on Beacon Hill, which is now called the Vilna Shul, which is not a synagogue anymore, it's a museum. But it had a Sam Katz Ark, and it had those hands. The book underneath is the prayer that the high priest says. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his countenance to shine upon you. You all know this prayer. And he grew up with that prayer. And so when he got to be a famous star, he incorporated it into uh, one of his rituals. Um, one interesting thing, there are eagles on either side. And very often you see American eagles and the wings are folded like this. Look over here at the American flag. You see the finial on the American flag, the eagle has his wings out like this. Um, Mr. Katz chose deliberately 
to make these eagles that way because he wanted to convey two things to the congregation. Number one, the symbol in this book of Psalms, uh, it says, may you be as swift as eagles to do the work of the Creator. And so the eagle has religious uh, symbolism in the Jewish religion. He also wanted to say, we are Jewish and we're very proud of being Jewish. We are also American and we are very proud of being American. And that's why those eagles look like the eagle on the finial um, of the American flag, is to convey that, yes, we're Jewish, and yes, this is a synagogue, and yes, this is a religious symbol, it is also a symbol of our Americanization. I want to mention very briefly, if you go into most synagogues these days, there'll be one light over the ark. That's the, the um, it's called the eternal light. It's a light that is always supposed to burn in the synagogue, but usually there aren't any lights else around this, the ark. There are a lot of lights on this ark. And Mr. Katz had worked um, when he first came here and he needed money, he worked, did you know, the merry-go-rounds, remember when you were a kid and you went to the merry-go-rounds with the little wooden horses? That was, in, that was quite a Jewish business, centered in New York, and Mr. Katz worked there making horses for merry-go-rounds. And it is my personal opinion, although again we have no way to prove it, that he looked at the, they cut, okay, you're coming from Eastern Europe, where there were no electric lights. And you come to America and there's light everywhere. And it's dazzling. If you've never experienced nothing but candles and fireplaces, all that light. And then he saw the carousels. Remember the lights around the carousels? And he just liked those lights. That's my opinion. He liked those lights so much that he put them on our heart. And we like that. We think they're pretty fabulous. Um, let me see. Okay, one more thing, and that is downstairs in the, uh, in the social hall, which was actually built in, 19, in the 1930s. Um, people couldn't afford to go out and do things, so they put a nice floor downstairs, and they made a room, and they used to have little social events here in the building. And one of the things that is down there is a portrait of George Washington, the Gilbert Stewart portrait of George Washington. Now many of you know that it is considered inappropriate to have representations of people in a synagogue. Why is there a picture of George Washington? Well, remember the children that I mentioned? They came here and they went to school. Uh, off of Faxon Street, there was a street called Jasset Street. The Stern School was the school for this neighborhood. And what did the children see in their classrooms? I don't know if anyone here is old enough to remember that it was a time when every classroom in America had Gilbert Stewart's portrait of George Washington and a portrait of Abraham Lincoln. The children of this congregation wanted everybody to understand, again, yes, we're Jewish. But we're also Americans, and we're proud of being Americans. So they hung the picture of Gilbert Stewart's George Washington downstairs to demonstrate their commitment to Americanism. There's also something um, which has to do with George Washington specifically. Um, at the end of the American Revolution, you remember, um, there was no government. They weren't quite sure. There was something called the Articles of Confederation. They weren't quite sure how they were going to govern this new country that they had just won. And there were lots of questions about what was going to go on in this new country. The Jewish community of Newport, Rhode Island, originally came from South America, then to Curacao, and then to Newport. These were people who had been expelled from one place after another, running from persecution because they were Jewish. So after the war was over, the Jewish community of Newport, Rhode Island, wrote a letter to President Washington. And they said, are we going to be allowed to stay, or should we pack our bags and leave? 
And it is, there's a famous letter, you may have heard of it, that Washington wrote back basically saying, of course you can stay. I'm going to guarantee it. This is important because Washington's letter was written before the establishment of the Bill of Rights. Of course, the Bill of Rights gives freedom of religion, but it was Washington's personal guarantee to the Jewish community that they could stay, that they would be welcomed. So that's another reason why Washington's portrait is here in the synagogue. Um, is there anything else I can tell you? Okay. Thank you. Oh, yes, sir. What's the size of the congregation here today? It's probably about 70 families, which is probably about the size of the, that the congregation has always been. Um, this neighborhood is kind of off the beaten track in many ways for the city of Newton and also for the Jewish community. The largest part of the Jewish community in Newton is in Newton Center. Um, and we are about two miles from there, which doesn't seem like much, but if you are a Sabbath observer and you don't ride on the Sabbath, in the winter, that's a long walk. Yes? Um, Could you talk about why the lectern is here in the middle? Ah, um, you're not supposed to turn your back on the ark during prayer. So if you've been to um, synagogues today, non-Orthodox synagogues, Many of them, the lecture is here, and all the prayers are said and directed toward the congregation, but you've got your back to the ark. And so it is considered more appropriate for the, the lecture to be in the middle. You can make announcements here, the rabbi gives a sermon here, things like that, but prayer is done at the lecture so that you're facing the ark and not with your back to the ark. You mentioned earlier the uh, lately, the South community, from South, from Asia, the community has been growing dramatically in Newton. Yes. Who has been displaced? Really, nobody. The housing stock here in Newton is very stable. So it isn't like gentrification in that we tore down your house and then you had to move out. What has happened is, Newton's, Newton's schools are considered to be very, very good. And people who are really concerned about the schools want to live in Newton. So what has happened is not that, that you've been forced out, but that financially the rents and everything have gone up enormously. Um, I would just, I'll give you an example. I mentioned my father was born at 59 Clinton Street, which was a four-room house. When that house went on the market about six or seven years ago, and had four rooms, and I'm not, I'm not minimizing, I'm telling you, four rooms, $400,000 for a four-room house. And enough room, you could park your car in the front, and that was, that was it. Um, when I look at the prices of these new condos that are going up, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars on my home. I can't believe it. People are being forced out by finances, not that we decided we don't like you here, or your group is not welcome here. It really is a matter of money. Uh, and the prices are being driven by the fact that people are willing, it appears to me, to pay almost anything to live here in Newton. So it, it's, it's a real challenge for anybody who wants to live here. Um, to be able to afford to live here. Other questions, comments? Sir. Yeah, I have a question. And it's um, it's related to the historic house tour. Mm -hmm. I, I got to see a house on the inside of the Street. There was a whole neighborhood over there that seemed very eclectic. It was an unusual, not quite working class, not quite rich. And I was wondering what that was and how that became. I'm sorry, I did not go on the tour, so I don't know exactly what you mean. But um, there are a lot of little... Remember, the idea of zoning yeah. is new. Not just to Newton, but in general. I, I was and, and so you see bigger houses and smaller houses and businesses on, uh, on the first floor and housing on top. All kinds of mixed things that don't exist anymore. I, was, I guess I was just wondering if that was part of like, the 
the same sort of types of families where Galen Street considered part of the Mount Mosaic. The, the line, yeah, there's, there's a line between Newton and Nonantum. Uh, someplace down on Watertown Street, um, I think that the supermarket is in Watertown. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. So the line is there somewhere. If you go down um, down Street. Watertown Street, Pearl Street the board. streets like Pearl Street, for Pearl example. Street's the um, hmm? Pearl Street's the board. Pearl, Pearl Street yeah, is the board. It's Adams, then it's but West, you Chapel, could, and But you could live. In Watertown, if you lived on Pearl Street, for example, you walk over the synagogue. The, 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 uh, the, the, the line is not where you live in Newton and Watertown, but whether people can walk here. Now, our synagogue, although we're an Orthodox synagogue, um, we don't care how you get here. We just want you to come here. So we have members who do drive. Um, our synagogue, I was president of this synagogue, so some of the the restrictions that we might hear about don't apply to our synagogue. It's a matter of personal choice. Other questions? Yes, Oh, for the rest of your prayer book. Yeah, they have a spring under them so that they will hold up so because the books get heavy after a while. What else? Oh yes, the, because we're an Orthodox synagogue, we have a balcony for the women upstairs. Um, we have women who are unable to climb the stairs, so we have built a little area in the back here where women can sit. Um, or if you have little kids, you want to be down here to keep an eye on the kids. That's it. Excellent. Thank you so much for all.